Frank's Red. Okay, so here's a true story. Several years ago, I was prowling around in a research lab at a major university, and I came across an invention, a breakthrough device, uh, an energy device, in a bottom drawer gathering dust. This thing had the potential to be twice as effective as anything on the market today, and it was in a bottom drawer gathering dust. I asked a brilliant young scientist why it was there, and she said to me, you know, it's so much trouble to commercialize stuff. It never works out. It's easier just to put it in a dumpster and go get another research grant. Think about it. This young woman had spent the majority of her life preparing to invent stuff. And when the moment came, she put it aside and neglected it. Now, sadly, this is not an unusual story, so remember that. You know, just this month, the President released the National Security Strategy, and I want to read part of it to you. He said, we must pursue science and research that enables discovery and unlocks wonders as unforeseen to us today as the surface of the moon and the microchip were a century ago. Simply put, he said, we must see innovation as a foundation of American power. Now, there's a huge irony there because I've just suggested to you that our innovation is being held hostage in the basements of our university. So what I want to do today is bring to your attention what I think is a huge national problem and opportunity, which is buried just beneath the surface of our collective consciousness, or perhaps in that dumpster. How many of you uh, paid your federal taxes this year? Okay, good, good. For the rest of you, there's some guys out that door in dark suits <laughs> that want to talk to you. But for the rest of us, we're not getting our money's worth. Here's how this is supposed to work. You and a few others are causing $50 billion a year, that's $50 billion every year, to be poured into our fabulous research universities in this country. They invent stuff. Those inventions then go out into the world, private capital is applied, companies get involved, and for you MBAs out there, the technical term is then that stuff that benefits society comes out the other end. That's the way it's supposed to work. Let me give you some numbers. In this country, there are about a quarter of a million research scientists. And two years ago, they disclosed about 20,000 inventions. And the universities that own those inventions uh, were issued about 3,600 patents. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, here's a few other numbers. Remember that dumpster. 30% of the inventions made were never disclosed. They aren't in that 20,000 number. They're in that proverbial dumpster. Furthermore, for those inventions that do make it through that long, skinny, torturous chain so that they finally wind up being licensed to our fine companies, go into commercial application. One half of one percent ever generate more than a million dollars in their lifetime. Think about it. One half of one percent in forever generating over a million bucks. This thing's broken. There are gaps in the chain, and it does not work. I suspect the president wouldn't be pleased to learn that, and we can't be either. Let's uh, try to dig in here and see what's going on to try to understand this. Here's a very simple uh, sort of roadmap of innovation. The chain from idea out to businesses. Now, the important thing to know about this is that every step along the way here requires the application, as many of you in this room know, of tons of hard work, expertise, process, <coughs> capital, 
to get to the next stage. And if you don't do that every step of the way, you get the gap we saw just a minute ago. Now, for a long time, venture capital has been around, uh, filling, by the way, that gap at the end of the chain. How many of you knew that the first successful VC was a woman? Queen Isabella of Spain, when she financed Columbus Voyage to the New World, uh, did very well. And like VCs since her, uh, they've created a lot of wealth, jobs, and good stuff for society. So if there's a VC sitting next to you, thank you. What they typically do is start with perceived demand in the marketplace and work backwards uh, down to late innovation stage. Note that they don't go back to the idea or invention stage. That's not what they do. I'm here today to call for the creation, the awareness, and then the creation of what my friend Satish Nambasan calls innovation capital. Simply put, it's sort of like venture capital, except that it operates differently. Uh, and its job is to actually take ideas and move them into existing businesses. That's a key distinction. It has the potential to create wealth, uh, just like venture capital, but it'll require less capital in all likelihood. You'll see faster exits, and the structure of it is really simple. Another important thing to note is that universities are in the business of ideas and inventions, and they're doing a good job of it, uh, but they don't have the capital to do what's shown here with innovation capital. That's not their job and they don't have access to either the capital or the expertise in the process that's necessary. If we get the clicker to work. I'm sorry. Oh. No, I, I think. Great, thanks. Here's another way to look at this. Here's your $50 billion. Now remember, that's your money. So here's your $50 million billion going into our fine universities, the best in the world. And at the top of the picture, you see our friends in the VC business. They're minding their patch. They're doing what they do. Important to note, though, is that of all the inventions created in our universities, only about 10% at the most should even be considered as the basis for a startup company. A little higher mathematics says that it leaves about 90%, which maybe would go through this process of additional work called translational research, capital supplied, and wind up being lodged in existing companies for some useful purpose. Now, what you just saw is that 90% of our inventions are just hanging out with nowhere to go and a huge gap in the chain. If I were you, I'd worry about that. Well, you know, you might ask, how come? Is our science that crummy? Are our brilliant scientists so incapable of building things and thinking about things that they simply have no potential commercial value? Well, of course not. Not the case. The, the reasons that this gap exists um, are, are several. They start with a popular notion that Innovation equals startup companies. That's wonderful. Many of us in this room, thank goodness, have done that. Um, but as you saw just a minute ago, that's only a small percentage of the tsunami of great ideas that are being built in our universities. Um, the, the, the gap also exists. You, you might be asking yourself, um, well, but what about open innovation? Surely our fine American companies are practicing the principles of open innovation. Well, they're trying. But the news is that it's not going very well. Once one of these viral new ideas actually gets a little visibility inside a corporation, a white corpuscles kick in, and people say, ooh, that's really different. Could be cool, but I am under such pressure, I'll just put it aside and I'll deal with it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. I got the sound effect special. <laughs> Tomorrow never comes. You know, the men and women that run America's corporations are smart people, and they know the importance of innovation. They don't need to be told that. The problem is that with the pressures on them, 
they allocate about 5% of their mind space to worrying about innovation. As a consequence, not much happens. They're frustrated, their companies are frustrated, and that gap continues. So let's see, companies are trying, but not getting the job done. We've seen that VCs are working their patch. It's not their problem. Universities are doing their job. So I'm not having a good time playing the blame game here. The, the point, really, is that I think the solution has to start in this room. We have to all understand that this gap exists. That's the first step. And then in ways that I can't begin to articulate today, I think we need to uh, go to our corporate friends and try to get them to think about this 5% problem I mentioned a minute ago. We really need to see that our companies begin to have access to this wellspring of innovation that they're denied right now. Many of you may have seen, as I did, the recent ABC report that showed the frantic efforts to clean up the catastrophic oil spill in the Gulf. And if you saw that, you would have seen uh, everything from shrimp boats pulling air balls to uh, trawlers deploying booms. You would have seen little Navy skimmer boats, huge corporate ships deployed by corporations, uh, Kevin Costner's centrifuge, massive vacuum cleaners, um, even people literally throwing chemicals by hand from outboard motor boats into the oil. Now, the point here, this illustrates a lot of what we're talking about. Probably one or some of those early technologies is, with, with more investment, could be the basis for, God forbid, wide deployment the next time this should happen. But who are you going to have go make that determination? The government with its political agenda? BP with its current crisis orientation, the inventors with their technology obsession. The point is that if you have any one of them try to make that determination, the odds are that worthwhile things will wind up in the dumpster. What a shame it is that the senior leadership at BP were trapped by that 5% rule, which virtually guaranteed that they didn't have any effective response to this crisis. That's a shame. So, I'm calling on us today, all of us who have a stake in this because it's our money and it's our nation, to step up to understand the need for innovation capital. Now, I think we can do this, we're smart enough to design a process, and if we stick to it, we can make a difference and keep some of that fabulous technology out of the dumpster. Thanks very much.